<clears throat> well, as you well know, that we've been going through Philippians verse by verse. I trust you've found this study very encouraging. I know I have. Um, it's just been a really enjoyable book. It's one of my favorites. And today we're going to look at encouragement along the way uh, at the end of, the, of chapter 3 in Philippians as Paul has been encouraging us to uh, keep our minds on things above, to press for the goal for the upward call of Christ Jesus. And one thing we can't deny about the book of Philippians uh, in that it's written from prison and that Paul was under trial, the Philippians were under trial, we can't deny that it's all about Jesus Christ. And we've been pointed to Jesus Christ through this book. And as I was thinking about this uh, passage in particular, and even the current events in our country and world, we live in interesting times, do we not? In, in fact, the better words, probably distressing times. And it's been on my mind a lot lately as I consider the moral state of our country, the hurting state of our economy, and the manner in which man treats fellow man. <clears throat> if you want to be discouraged, just look around at the many who are in great need, or the homes broken by selfishness. It's all around us. And perhaps you, like me, were severely distraught at the capacity of an individual to recently carry out the horrors that took place in Newport, Connecticut. And we ask ourselves, how could this be? How, what is wrong with us? And yet I found this timely study in Philippians to be an excellent encouragement through trial and through these questions that we face. The Philippians were in difficult times as well. They were poor and a persecuted church, and they too needed encouragement. And here at the end of Philippians 3, Paul is giving them and us an appeal for you to walk in light of eternity. An appeal for you to walk in light of eternity. And by way of review, because Paul's working off a continuing thought here, last week Philip Warmanham covered uh, verses 10 through 16. And in that study we saw a precious glimpse into the perspective of the Apostle Paul. We studied the intimate relationship available to all believers, and that should be desired by all believers. As Paul says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And this was a pinnacle desire in Paul's personal Christian life, that I may know him. As Philip covered last week, it's a purpose clause. This was Paul's intense desire. And we also saw that he had a single-minded single focus on Jesus Christ and the things of eternity. In verse 12, he says, Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And so we've... Paul covers how he wants to have an intimate relationship with Christ. He's pressing for eternity and really what will matter in light of eternity. And we also see the benefits of this attitude, the benefits of an eternal perspective in verses 15 and 16, where Paul uh, covers how the Lord uh, will, has his redirecting hand. If any, in verse 15, if let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will, will reveal even this to you. And so there's many benefits uh, or to this eternal mindset. Paul lays this out, and we're continuing that thought here today. And I trust at some level it resonated with you that really the only worthwhile thing in light of eternity to pursue is Jesus Christ and the things of, that will matter in light of eternity, the souls of men and such. And perhaps last week, Paul's perspective left you encouraged and excited that I want to have the same perspective. I want to uh, press forward for the upward call. It's all about Jesus Christ. And yet, after a week's passed, perhaps the holidays had you busy, you may, ha you may have more of the uh, perspective that maintaining a focus on Jesus Christ is a lot easier said than done. And so Paul ends this section of the letter with an encouragement 
to walk in light of eternity. And we begin in verse 17 of Philippians chapter 3, where he says, Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who so walk, as you have us for a pattern. And we see initially here that walking in light of eternity will involve following the example of others who are pursuing heavenly things. Walking in light of eternity will involve following the example of others who are pursuing heavenly things. <clears throat> now, is it wrong to follow others? No. We can subtly adopt the thinking at times, though, that I'm following Jesus Christ. I don't want to be legalistic or over-dependent on people. And sometimes get the idea that this following others would just be mechanical. And that's not necessarily true. But really the question is, why should we follow others? Isn't, isn't Christ enough? And you see, we all need an object lessons at times. I've learned that in marriage, uh, that a story isn't as well told, um, directions aren't as well given without hands moving and describing the parameters of what happened. My wife is an entirely a visual learner, and it comes out in her daily life. And I really admire the fact that as a teacher, she goes to great lengths to make her lessons full of visual stimulation and object lessons for the kids she teaches. But why does she do that? Because that's what teachers or Sunday school teachers are supposed to do? Or that's just what came in the college curriculum, and that's what they were taught? No, it's a true teacher will give an object lesson because the students need it. And just as those kids need it, at times we need a visual lesson, an object lesson as well in life. And the object of our faith and the one we follow is certainly Jesus Christ, but he is invisible to us. And in the weakness of our humanity and through the process of our spiritual growth, we need at times to have that visible example of how to think, how to respond, what it means to walk by faith. The problem is, or we err when, we do what we do as unto others. And the difference is the same difference between a son learning the trade of his father and using his father as example. Okay, Dad, how do you do this? How do you go about this process? How do, how do I figure this thing out? And the diff and in comparison to this son just merely going into the trade because he thinks his father will be happy with him because of it. We don't do what we do as unto others, and yet we can use others as a benchmark, a sounding board for counsel and as an example. And we certainly need this visual example at times, and not only that, but personal exhortation of spiritual leaders and mature believers to understand what it means to walk this walk of faith to pursue eternal things and to live for Jesus Christ. It calls to my mind the verse, Hebrews 13, 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. It's entirely biblical to follow this pattern that's been set before us. Just as the song goes, and because I'm sick today, I won't sing it, but faithful men have gone before us. Let me... Uh, make me Lord a faithful man. And this is the part of the design of the local church so that as believers grow and mature and, and uh, walk with the Lord, they can encourage, instruct, and be an example to those who are newer believers, who haven't grown to that degree. And may I say, we do well to seek counsel, to be observing our spiritual leaders, those who are spiritually more mature than us in the faith, because none of us stand alone. Now in this passage, we want to note, as Paul has uh, several times throughout this epistle already, that he's talking to believers. He begins verse 17 with brethren. So uh, believers are in address here, and that's good to know because a believer cannot, or a non-believer, unbeliever, cannot follow the pattern of uh, Paul of a spiritual example. And may I ask you, are you one of the brethren here today? 
Do you know where you'll spend eternity? Have you seen that Jesus Christ was enough? In fact, I just talked to an individual uh, about a week and a half ago who, in his perspective, could see that Jesus Christ was a good example, see from the Bible that he was called a Savior, but he'd never placed his personal trust in Jesus Christ alone. And he also th- thought he had to do uh, things in addition. I live a good life. At the end, God will weigh me in the balances, and I try to live each day without regrets, so God will honor that. Is that your perspective? Or have you seen that you're a helpless, hopeless sinner for whom Christ died and you need a Savior? And by simply trusting in Him, you can know where you'll spend eternity. So Paul is speaking to these brethren here. And he says what to them? He says, brethren, join in following my example. Join in following my example. And that means to be an imitator together with others. A joint imitator with others. And it's a, in the present tense, middle voice, an imperative mood, it means that it's a command we're continually to fulfill, but it's of great benefit to ourselves t- to carry this out. Join in imitating the example of Paul, of faithful men and women. And what is implied in this phrase, join in following me in my example? Unity among the saints is in view here. And that's a theme that runs throughout the epistle of Philippians, that we are to have unity. We're to be of one mind, Philippians 2.1, together, of, of a single mind together, pursuing Jesus Christ. As believers, as believers especially in a local church, we should be functioning as a unified team, a harmonious family with the common goal of pursuing Jesus Christ, of lifting Him up, of learning to Him, of spreading his gospel. We, need, we ought to be unified. And yet, what is the basis for genuine unity? If you just flip back to me, back with me in, in chapter 2, verse 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 2. Paul says, says to the Philippians, Fulfill my joy by being like minded having the same love, being of one cord, of one mind. There's this like-mindedness, and Paul's covered the fact that it's truth. The real basis for genuine unity is a like mind around truth. And you cannot have genuine unity when unity is merely for unity's sake. And I had the opportunity this last week, about a week ago, to talk to a pastor who, who said, you know what, all these churches, we're getting together in town and we're going to just worship the Lord. Jesus is Lord. That's right and that's all we need to know, right? And I said, oh, well, that ought to be a nice time. Because you can't have unity if it's not based around a common mind. And you can't really have uh, unity unless it's based on truth. You don't, or a genuine unity unless it's based on truth. So he says, join in following my example. Believers, come together. Pursue, just as I've covered that I want to know Jesus Christ, I'm pursuing the eternal things of Jesus Christ. Even verse 16, I'm continuing on in, in, follow, in following Jesus Christ. Join in following my example. Come together and pursue Jesus Christ. Now, another obvious question could be asked here. Was this arrogant of the Apostle Paul? How could he say this? Join in following my example. You see, it reminds me of Numbers 12, 3, where Moses himself wrote, Now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. How can someone say things like this? Follow my example. I'm the most humble person on the earth. If I said that this morning, there'd hopefully be a lot of you that might even just get up and walk out at that point. So how could Paul say this? You see, Paul wasn't promoting Paul. 
He was, wasn't lifting Paul up. He was pointing others to his Savior. In fact, Paul only said, follow my example, because this was his perspective. Imitate me, 1 Corinthians 11.1. 1. Imitate me just as I also imitate Christ. Paul was imitating his Savior. He was following uh, Jesus Christ, and he wanted them to follow along with him. He was merely a visible reflection of a Christ-filled life, and he had served and sacrificed for the Savior and could say, it's worth it. Follow me this way. It's as he was, though he was a coach on the sideline, shouting direction and encouragement to his players. This way. Keep going. It's worth it. Try harder. Or not that that Christian life is about try harder. But he's a coach on the sideline saying, shouting that encouragement along. And he says, Brethren, follow, join in following my example and note those who so walk. The Greek word is skopeo. And it means to watch or notice carefully, to exert effort in continually inquiring information regarding some matter with the implication of concern is how to respond appropriately. It's where we get the word scope or derivative microscope. There's this straining to, to view with knowing how to respond. And this is a present act of an imperative. It's a command that we're supposed to continually note, seek out, find, or watch, observe these people and their example of following Jesus Christ or example of faith. But this implies something, that we have an intimate relationship cultivated with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we have an intense and ongoing interest in Christ. Because if we don't have an interest in Christ, we're not going to have an interest in observing those who follow Christ. We're not going to have an interest in their uh, study of the Word, in their example, how they respond in situation in the trial, if we don't walk with Christ ourselves. And so then we can ask, how do you follow the, exa- follow the example of believers like this? It's a good question. Do we just mimic their every move? Now a new believer might do that. And a new believer might need that, in a sense, as an uh, older, more mature believer to help bring them along and establish them in the faith, teach, and t- teach them some of the basics, as well as certainly hear the Word of God, over the pulpit, but do we mimic their every move? No, we follow examples like this, or we walk down these paths or observe these believers as we watch how they respond in faith. And you see that it's worth them to serve their Savior. You see the principles that take place in your life and see how they respond, and I can apply that here. And man, I'm discouraged, but I'm really encouraged with so-and-so's example and how they're responding by faith there. And you also can seek counsel. You know, the heart that does not want to seek counsel, the heart that bucks at the idea, like, why would you ever seek counsel from spiritual leadership, just reeks of an authority problem. Older believers, and especially our spiritual leaders there, are here in this church and as a principle, are there to be a sounding board, are there to get counsel. And we know from Proverbs that he who seeks counsel is wise. You see, they are there for a pattern, the end of verse 17. And note those who so walk, for you have us for a pattern. And the Greek word there is typos, often translated or transliterated type, or a model of behavior and thinking for us to follow, for us to uh, even imitate. But what can we appreciate about Paul's example and exhortation? Follow me. I'm following Jesus Christ this way. It's worth it. What can we appreciate? That he addresses our thinking in verses 10 10 through 16 before he addresses our walk. If he were to just say, try harder, I'm going this way, I've done this many spiritual things, you should do this many spiritual things. I'm getting beaten for Christ, you should get beaten for Christ. Wouldn't that be discouraging? No, he appeals first 
to our mindset, which Philip covered last week, that I want to know Christ. I'm pressing for the goal. And even if you uh, err in your thinking, the Lord will correct that. Just keep walking with Him. Follow me. Keep up the good... Or keep up your walk of faith. Keep looking to the Lord. And then follow my example. And note those who walk. And a little application to his message here. We can highly appreciate that, that he addresses our thinking first. As only Christ can enable this walk of faith as we look to him in faith. And so... Walking in light of eternity involves following the example of others who are pursuing heavenly things. And walking in light of eternity will avoid, uh, in, involve avoiding the example and the influence of those who mind earthly things. Walking in light of eternity will uh, involve avoiding the example and influence of those who mind earthly things. <coughs> Philippians 3 Verses 18 and 19. Paul says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. Now in Paul's, in contrast to Paul's pursuit of Jesus Christ, his pressing for the goal, and those who share his direction, he warns of a particular group of people and their way of thinking. And in our politically correct culture, it can, be, it can al- almost naturally cause us to bristle that he's naming names or he's po- pointing someone out. And yet Paul, clearly directed by the H- Holy Spirit, found it necessary to make this warning and even to single this mindset out. And so as we see from verse 17 that we want to follow the pattern of Paul, of faithful and spiritual believers who are pursuing Jesus Christ, we also want to be aware of a type of thinking and even perhaps people who might court us to this type of thinking. And so those who Paul describes are characterized as what? Here in these couple verses. They're characterized as being enemies of the cross of Christ. Enemies of the cross of Christ. Those are harsh or very serious words. And so what does the word enemy mean? This Greek term is used as a general term in the New Testament for enemy uh, in a variety of cases and a variety of different, between different people. And yet the word carries the idea to be in in opposition with, which is pretty natural for an enemy, but it implies a hostile attitude. So what are they specifically enemies of? They are opposed and even hostile to the cross of Christ. They're enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. Not enemies of God, not enemies of believers, but specifically the cross of Christ. And is that any surprise? As Galatians 5.11 says, And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, adding works to the finished work of Christ, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. What is the cross? The cross is offensive to us. And it's also seen as foolish. As Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 1, 17 and 18, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us, or to to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The cross is offensive and the cross is, is foolish. Have you come to grips with that view of your Savior and His work for you? That it's offensive and it's foolish? That's what our world, how our world sees it. That's how the religious, uh, both false teachers and their learners, view the cross of Christ. I mentioned last time I taught of a former classmate who I had, I had in high school who became a Lutheran pastor. And again, one of the nicest guys on the planet probably, the, the type that'll bend over. And yet, in our discussions on spiritual things, at least now, not back in high school, the cross is offensive to him, and especially the message of the cross, because it's Jesus Christ alone. 
And he, not taking the word of God literally or as absolute truth, will just bristle at that because nice people got to go to heaven. And his sermons are full of, uh, to my, what I can gather, are full of niceties and warm, fuzzy feelings. He's talking about how he can uh, preach this Christmas sermon and just lift people up. And yet I haven't seen him mention the name of Jesus Christ. And so he would find the cross and the message of the cross offensive. And even foolishness that good people got to go to heaven. But there's also those who are closer to our camp, closer to us, the gospel, gospel advocates, that are I would deem them as, in ways, enemies or in opposition to the cross of Christ. Not because they don't believe in Jesus Christ, not because they don't believe he died on the cross and paid for their sins, but they're touting a message that is completely irreverent of the work of Christ on the cross, of the blood he shed and the redemption that it offers. They really subtly oppose the cross of Christ and therefore, in a form, make them enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, he's, they're also described not only as enemies of the cross of Christ, but having an end of destruction having an end of destruction, if you really consider these terms, these are really serious accusations. Now their end or result is that of destruction. And that means that could mean literal destruction or ruin. It's used in Philippians 1.28 of eternal judgment. In other words, uh, it's a proof of perdition, proof that they're unsaved in 1.28. But it can also mean an action demonstrating complete disregard for the value of something. Needless squandering of some resource. In other words, a, misplaced affection results, resulting in loss. That's what destruction is. Misplaced affection resulting in loss. And so I ask you as believers here today, where does your affection lie? Is it with the cross and this Savior who died on the cross, with his word, with the fellow believers? Or does something else get you going? Their end is destruction. Also, we note that they are characterized as making their God their own belly. They're making their God their own belly. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean that they make their God their own belly? I think we can say it this way, that they are in the ministry that they're in for what they can get out of it. Just as Paul uh, noted those in Romans 16, 18, saying, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Now these might be in it for financial gain, or because they simply refuse to follow, or for some pride issues, they like having a following themselves. But we know that they're not sacrificing in service for the Savior. They're in it for what they can get out of it. They serve their own belly, in essence. And self is their objective, whether it's subtle or more obvious. And just to put a face to this, and I think these are very fair to point these people out. A Benny Hinn, who is a faith healer, lives in a multi-billion dollar mansion, I believe, is what uh, CNN covered or, or one of those nightly news programs. Heals people repeatedly, pushes them over, and touts himself as the self-proclaimed faith healer uh, in this country, and he has a huge following. But I think I would go so far to say is not only does he not tout a true gospel message, let alone mention Jesus Christ all that much, but he's a false teacher. And he's in it for his own gain. Or Joel Osteen. I just saw a book walking by Barnes & Noble about a week ago that said, make every day a Friday, Joel Osteen. Because it's been studied that people are happier on Fridays. 
So make every day a Friday, as he taught him. And who could refuse that lovely smile that never leaves his face? Make every day a Friday. Well, yeah, I admit that I am really happy to go home after work on a Friday afternoon, but what does that have to do with spiritual things? And he, too, is profiting immensely financially in popularity and such. And yet, as Jesus Christ mentioned, I read a review of that very book, and it said, Jesus Christ, I don't think, was mentioned one time in there. Or if it was, it was only in reference to how he was an example and not really the uh, creator of the universe, the true God. And so there's these, those who are in it for their own gain, who make their God their own belly. And what's the result? As we saw in 1618, they with smooth words and flattering speech deceive the hearts of the simple. They deceive them. And that's why it's no, doubt, no wonder why Paul says the ne- in his next point that they are characterized as finding their glory in, the th- in that which should be shameful. In that which should be shameful. Instead of censoring their fleshly thrills, they boast and glory and promote that for which they should be embarrassed. Now, Paul had an example of this right in this passage. The Judaizers, who were adding circumcision to the work of Christ, as well as other aspects of the law. And they, with much pride, added those rituals to the work of Christ. And they should have been ashamed. In essence, they were saying Christ didn't do enough. And they were proud of it. And others, even in our day, have some cause or play their one-string banjo in that we're really grace-oriented in the face of blatant sin. We're no longer being lorded over as they lack spiritual order in local churches and, and typically aren't organized in evangelism or, or, or whatnot. They have their cause. We're all coming together, like the pastor I talked to uh, about a week ago. We're all coming together for, for what? Go to the country club for crying out loud. There's no doctrinal agreement there. And in those things, well, at times they sound nice, and I'm glad they're grace-oriented, and I'm glad you're now free. They should be ashamed of those things because they don't accord with spiritual principle, with biblical principle. And rather being humiliated by this, they earn their spurs, and they puff out their chest, and they're proud of it. And yet we need to be careful because can we be guilty of this? not so much as a cause or a life goal, but in our life too, we can at times glory in that which should be shameful. And we do well to take a humble look at ourselves in that. And that's why we want, Paul is listing, or uh, describing these people, that we might even avoid their influence and example. And lastly, he notes that these people, this mindset is characterized as fixating on earthly things fixating on earthly things. Verse 19 again, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. And the word set their mind means to keep giving serious consideration. And really, the literal transliteration from the Greek text would be earthly things thinking. Do you have earthly things thinking? And perhaps this reminds you of the uh, converse instruction in Colossians 3, 1 through 4, where Paul writes it, Then if you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears then you also will appear with him in glory. Really, in a lot of ways, it's a parallel passage. And appeal to follow the Lord and set mind, your mind on things above in light of who you are in Jesus Christ. Now, how do these individuals, even how does this mindset, if we're, uh, as we are capable of it, could be guilty of it, how, does it practically, how do they practically set their mind on earthly things? 
Well, obviously, there's a, probably a myriad of different scenarios, but they're concerned with worldly causes and pursuits more than the cause of the gospel, the cause of Jesus Christ. And they may spiritualize those causes. They, causes. they may be political. They may be moral in nature or love of fellow man. And yet they ignore so often Jesus Christ and what he has instructed us to do by way of going into all the world and preaching the gospel, by way of teaching the word of God. I'm really glad that you built homes for families, and yet did you take any concern for their spiritual state? So they can practically get caught up with worldly causes and and, and pursue those things. Not that they're wrong in and of themselves, but in without taking, they're lacking without taking, uh, uh, giving credit to Christ or, or taking the gospel to the, to people who, to whom they minister. But there's also those who want to get what they can get out of this world while ignoring Jesus Christ. Or perhaps even nodding to him while they get the things that they want out of this world. And that's where we're far more prone to fail, isn't it? Play church and, and set our minds on the things down here. And so these are really characteristics of these people that we need to be aware of. And how should we respond to this warning, this uh, that Paul gives of this mindset of these people. I would say we need to avoid their example and their negative spiritual influence. Now note that I said avoid their example and influence, and I didn't say avoid them altogether, for we're not pious and proud in our little righteous circles here at Duluth Bible Church or anywhere else. But we need to evaluate, in other words, how we're being affected, and who's affecting us. Have you done that ever? I really like this person, but really, what are they pushing at you? I like this person, but where does that relationship lead you to go? And see, the point really is that, is Paul's encouraging to follow Jesus Christ, and you do not want to be impacted negatively by this mindset and even by perhaps people who might tout it or, or court you in it. And you know, it might come down to the, it might very well come down to this in Romans 6.17 that as Paul says, I urge you brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you uh, learned and avoid them. Now again, we don't have this little righteous circle mentality and will shun people. But if someone's causing division, if someone's leading you down the road of an authority problem or, or uh, even in unbiblical thinking of various sorts, it might come down to this, that there needs to be a separation there. And as you're walking with the Lord and pursuing the things of Jesus Christ and saying, that's what I want, that separation often comes naturally. Now, I purposely didn't asked this question till now, but is Paul referring to believers or unbelievers? And I read this passage through, and I read it through, and even consulted commentaries and looked at uh, my study helps and what words mean and how are they used other places in Scripture. And there, the plain and simple of it is there's a lot of different opinions, a lot of different interpretations of this passage. And I couldn't help, after really praying about it, thinking, I wonder if Paul left that vague for a reason. Because can false teachers be enemies of the cross of Christ? Well, yeah. Can they... Uh, is there end destruction? Well, certainly. If not in a vanity of fruit sense, if in the sense of uh, their eternal destiny. Their God is their belly. Well, that's clear. Glory is in their shame and set their mind on earthly things. And yet the same can be true of believers, can it not? As we oppose ourselves to, or as we refuse to submit to the Word of God and perhaps uh, even stray from its truths, we can make ourselves the enemies of, of the cross of Christ. In fact, we know that 
uh, from Romans 8 that the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's not uh, beyond biblical parameters. Can believers have a result of destruction or, or emptiness? Yeah. Can they serve their own belly and can they glory in shameful things and can they set their mind on things below? Well, yeah, we're exhorted. That's why we're exhorted to do the opposite. And so I think the question isn't so much is this believers or unbelievers, for it could be both, I believe. But I think the real question is, who will you follow? And you might say, I'm not following anyone. I'm my own person. And yet, you'll follow someone. We'll, it's just a principle in life that you will follow someone's example. And we all really need to evaluate before the Lord who that will be. Now you might say, no, I get it, I get it. Follow the spiritually mature people and avoid worldly influences. And I hope you don't make it as mechanical as that. As Paul, at the end of his, this chapter and thus this section in Philippians, is encouraging an eternal mindset, a pursuit of Jesus Christ. And here's a little warning. But we should ask ourselves, why? What should, why should I serve Jesus Christ? Or what motivates me in following this example or pursuit of cause? And Paul anticipates that and answers that in verses 20 and 21, where he gives the reason and motivation why you should walk in light of eternity, why you should pursue the things of Jesus Christ. And we note first that an eternal walk and mindset are rooted in your heavenly identity. Verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now the word citizenship there is the Greek word polituma. And it occurs only here in the New Testament. And Paul here is exhorting believers to appropriate their conduct. Paul tells them that their true homeland is in heaven. On earth they have no right of citizenry. They are not citizens rooted in nature, thought, or interest. The point is not that they are a foreign colony in earthly states, but aliens in the earthly sphere as such. And by constitutional right, they belong to the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ. Their, the kingdom of heaven is their litima, their citizenship, where they hail from, and they should act accordingly. They should respond in light of it. And so when Paul says your citizenship in, is in heaven, this would have hit home with the Philippians because they were Roman citizens. And as Roman citizens, they enjoyed some, uh, some great benefits, uh, both politically and even judicially and socially as these Roman citizens. And often, Roman citizens were very proud of their Roman citizenship. And they, perhaps even some in the church said, I'm a citizen of Rome. And Paul says, not, or wipes that slate clean and says, live for Jesus Christ, follow my example, watch out for this one. Why? Because you're a citizen of heaven. Well, well, well I'm, a, I'm a citizen of Rome. No, you're a citizen of heaven. And Peter uh, encourages that same mindset in 1 Peter 2.11 where he said, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. Do you view yourself as a sojourner and a pilgrim just passing through? We ought to. If it's true that our citizenship is in heaven, if it's true that it's worth it to serve Jesus Christ, we're just a pilgrim passing through. And this is all rooted not because of um, some vague concept here just in this verse, but it's rooted in our position in Christ. In Galatians 2.20, we see our unity, our identification with Christ in that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There's that identification with the death 
and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And even Him as our mode of living. He who lives through us. We see it as well in Ephesians 2, 4-6. through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ. So we have an exalted position that really uh, shakes out to a heavenly citizenship with Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ. This is a great privilege to have this citizenship. And we do well to live in light of it and take heed to it. Just as the Philippians could say, we're Roman citizens. No, there's a higher calling. I don't know if anyone here is really thankful to be a citizen in Duluth in January approaching. But we don't have to because we're citizens of heaven, not of the icebox. And what is notable in this? What is notable in this reality that our citizenship is in heaven? It's a present reality because our citizenship is in heaven, not will be in heaven. We look for it one day when we get to heaven. It's a present reality and not a future hope. It's true of you right now as a believer in Jesus Christ. So have you mentally accepted the place of your citizenship and that you are an alien on this earth? Therein lies the rub, does it not? Because as we accept the fact, I'm a citizen of heaven, I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus Christ, then pursuing the things of Jesus Christ, having the eternal mindset, uh, even living for what's going to count in light of eternity, is a natural choice if we can accept the fact that we're an alien down here and living for anything in this world is vanity. Our heavenly identity and accepting our heavenly identity will yield a Christ-filled or give way to a Christ-filled life. And so, an eternal walk and mindset are rooted in your heavenly identity, and an eternal walk and mindset eagerly anticipates meeting the Lord. It eagerly anticipates meeting the Lord. Verse 20 again. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There's an intensity there. A stretching of the neck and sense. We eagerly wait. We eagerly, eagerly anticipate meeting the Lord, going home to be with Him. That's why He's our blessed hope, Titus 2, 11 through 13 For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. We see this verse a lot here at DBC. Have we grown dull to it? That looking, that stretching, that yearning to meet Jesus Christ. And really, we all look forward to something. So what are you looking forward to? What are you waiting for? What's the next big thing on your docket that you want to see? And if it's not Jesus Christ, in a sense, ultimately, then your affections are misappropriated. That's why when Christ was preparing to leave this earth, he said, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. He said that as words of comfort for the, his disciples and recorded in his eternal word for our uh, comfort through the ages that he's going to come back for us. And we know within going home that in 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4, we see that blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. What do we wait for? To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven for you. 
the point Paul's trying to get here, in which I'm somewhat laboring over, is that Jesus Christ in eternity in heaven is the only fulfilling and fitting object of, the, of expectation for the believer. Because all we really have is there. Think about what you have. Your home, your car, things you throw in your garage and basement and attic. They aren't coming with us. The Word of God, our Savior, and the saints around us right here are what we have and who, what, who we'll spend eternity with. And so are you yearning for His returning? And lastly, an eternal walk and mindset rests confident in the confident expectation of being ultimately conformed to the image of Christ. Of being ultimately conformed to the image of Christ. Verse 21, Who, being Jesus Christ, will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to His glorious body, according to the working by which He is able, even to subdue all things to Himself. Now, how is your body described in this verse? It's as low, described as lowly. The word means uh, humiliating or that of low status. And isn't that good for us to remember as we stare in the gym mirror, as we're counting our calories or doing whatever? We can dump so much time and money and effort into our bodies, and body like exercise does profit a little. But keep it in perspective. Our bodies are lowly. And they're fading and deteriorating and passing away. And we need to be reminded that these bodies cannot be compared to that which await, what awaits us. Our earthly bodies are good reminders that investing in this world is short-lived and empty. And that's why we look forward to having this change in us. In 1 John 3, 2, John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know this, that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. We're going to get a new glorified body. I have a cold right now and I'm feeling pretty... I have no problem admitting my body's lowly. Not to mention the Christmas treats that have bombarded me this Christmas season. My body is lowly. And yet... Where's the real hope in it? We might work out, we might eat healthy, and yet we see those ahead of us who pass away, the loved ones that uh, are with us no more. And where's the hope in all of it? The hope is in becoming like Jesus Christ and getting a new glorified body. And can you count on this new body? Well, yes. Why, though? Verse 21, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. You see, your future glorified body and your confirmation to the image of Christ is as sure as the sovereign omnipotence of the Son of God. With what power, with what ability was he able to even subdue all things to himself? Well, he's the God of all creation. He put it here. He put us here. And that power guarantees we're going to be conformed to his image. So what can we take away from Philippians 3, 17 through 21? It's worth it to serve Jesus Christ. And in doing so, we're going to follow someone. Ultimately, that object needs to be Jesus Christ. But as visible object lessons or reflections, they're going to be some pattern, some model. And we need to evaluate who that is or who that will be. And might I note, might I note that at some point, you will be that person, most likely. You'll either be a pattern person after Jesus Christ, reflecting the Savior, um, responding to Him, living in light of eternity, or you will be in opposition to the cross of Christ. However, subtly, or obviously, it comes out in your life. And we also want to note that we not only 
do well, but we need to think and live each day within the framework of our heavenly citizenship and our spiritual identity with Jesus Christ. Nothing else is fitting for us, for us to live as uh, though we belong here is highly unfitting and unreasonable for us to think. Our condition, our walk, should match our position in Jesus Christ. And that's why I leave you with Galatians 2.20 again. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Paul was wrapped up in his identity with Jesus Christ. His framework for living was Jesus Christ. His enablement for living was Jesus Christ. Are you wrapped up with Jesus Christ? And are you even seeking an example and counsel from those who are wrapped up in Jesus Christ? We do well to take heed to that. Let's pray. Father, I just give you thanks for this study. I thank you for the book of Philippians. I thank you for this passage that we can't deny the fact we'll follow someone and yet we want to take heed to that and be thinking in light of our position in Christ, our citizenship in heaven. Thank you that we're just pilgrims and sojourners down here and that our roots don't need to be planted in this world, that we can live with, uh, for our Savior and live in, for things that have eternal value and that aren't simply passing away. And so, uh, just give you thanks for this passage and study. Pray for Scott next hour and pray that our fellowship would be sweet and Christ-centered Uh, both here uh, in the break and around church and even during the holidays. And I pray for even lost family members who might be visiting or we are visiting with during the holidays. Pray that you might just open opportunities for the gospel. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.